uh, trained as a lawyer, had a lot of family money, and as many men of his generation did in the 1920s, decided to devote himself to social causes, uh, believed in uh, social progress in various ways, and was in fact one of the forerunners of the modern environmental justice movement in some ways. He was very concerned with the loss of endangered species in the world. And so what he went on to do, for instance, is to do some very noble things. He established the Bronx Zoo. He built the American Bison Society to protect the endangered species of the American buffalo. He was also instrumental in helping to lobby Congress for the establishment of the uh, Denali and Glacier National Parks. But one of the endangered species that he thought needed protection in the world was white people. He was also the founder of the American Eugenics Society. And so in 1916, Madison Grant wrote a book that he called The Passing of the Great Race. And what he did in this book is he articulated a theory of history and of civilization which said that most of the advancements of humankind had been done by a group of people that he called the Nordics. These were people primarily coming from North and Western Europe. And so he believed that these are the people that were our founding fathers, had established the basis of our government, and now we're being threatened by enormous immigration from places in which the people were not capable of maintaining democratic government. At the time, this was Central and Eastern and Southern Europe. So he created a theory about whiteness that said that the truly white people are the Nordics, and they are primarily the people of Scandinavia, the British Isles, and a smattering of the Saxons from Germany. Most other people are related to white people, but they're not entirely white people. So you have to suspect the Germans. You certainly should not allow the Italians, the Greeks, the Russians, the Czechs, or what was called at the time Poles or Bohemians. All of these people, according to Madison Grant, were not white people and should not be allowed into the United States because they would essentially pollute the gene pool and destabilize the well-being of the United States. So you might say, wow, this is a really wacky theory. And it was. We have a copy of The Passing of the Great Race actually in the library. It's a beautiful book, actually. It's a fine volume. It has all these great maps in it uh, that show the sort of progress of civilization through time. And he sort of ties this all back into this Nordic people's activity. I just wanted to read something to you from The Passing of the Great Race. So you can hear the echoes of this language from 1916 in the words of, for instance, Representative Steve King from 2016. Right, so uh, Madison Grant writes, the Nordics are all over the world, a race of soldiers, sailors, adventurers, and explorers, and above all, rulers, organizers, and aristocrats, in sharp contrast to the essentially peasant character of the Alpines, Central Europeans. Chivalry and knighthood, and their still surviving but greatly impaired counterparts, are particularly Nordic traits. And feudalism, class distinction, and race pride amongst Europeans are traceable for the most part to the North. Remember thinking about what Steve King said, right? That all of Western civilization can be, all of human goodness can be traced to this kind of Western civilization. Echoes of this Nordic theory. It's not surprising that there's this echo because Madison Grant was not some sort of kooky outlier. The Passing of the Great Race was a bestseller in the United States. In fact, he caught the eye of many federal legislators. He was invited, in fact, to come to give private tutorials to members of Congress. He was put in charge of an ad hoc committee on immigration reform. And the result of that committee was a proposal for immigration reform that became law in 1924. 
This is the Johnson Reed Act, or the National Origins Act of 1924. And essentially what this bill did was one of the most restrictive bills in US history. Is it said that, you know, the, the, it's complicated, but the essential makeup is this, that if you come from northern or uh, west, northwestern Europe, almost no quotas on you coming in. So those groups of people could come as they wish in the United States. But severe restrictions were put on peoples coming from southern and eastern Europe, those peoples that were not really white. Recall, by this point already, Asia was entirely walled off from the United States. So the National Origins Act, what it was doing was crafting a very particular kind of demographic in the United States. A white majority dominated primarily by people from northern and northwestern Europe. And this demographic trend proceeded <laughs> throughout most of the 20th century until it was changed in 1965 when the Johnson Reed Act was finally overturned. So we have to understand something, that the demographic makeup of the population of the United States was consciously crafted by a white supremacist theorist who was able to capture the ear of some of our most prominent politicians to craft the United States as a, saven, a haven, a safe place for the right kind of white people. By the way, um, Madison Grant went on then to draft another piece of legislation for the state of Virginia, which was called uh, the, uh, I believe it's called the Racial Exclusion Act of 1924. This prohibited the marriage between white people and non-white people, and it was the basis for prohibiting interracial marriage throughout the United States until it was overturned by the Supreme Court in 1967 in the case of Loving v. Virginia. <laughs> One other fun fact about Madison Grant, he had a really big fan. In fact, Madison Grant was really proud of a letter that he received from a European, a young European activist who told him that essentially the theory of Nordic supremacy that he read in The Passing of the Great Race greatly inspired him and gave him theoretical justification for his own ideas. This young European was Adolf Hitler. The passing of the great race was entered into evidence at the Nuremberg trials because it had been passed around the Nazis as a kind of basis for their own genocide, right, of six to 10 million people during the part of the 20th century. So to some extent, to some way, the United States is responsible for Nazism. At least we gave a theoretical backing to what was developing in many ways in Europe. And what always surprises me is that no one knows about Madison Grant, but he almost alone shaped our immigration policy to have it reflect the needs and interests of a certain kind of group of white people. This changed in 1965 as a result of many different kinds of pressures, primarily because of the pressures of the civil rights movement and so forth. Right? The, uh, the idea was to eliminate national origins as the basis for allowing people in. And in 1965, we had a policy that then shifted the demographics of immigrants coming to the United States. Right? Primarily, starting in 1965, this is where we start to get more people from Africa, Asia, and Latin America into the United States which is now the majority of immigrants that come to the United States. And it also created the policy of family reunification. This is the policy that President Trump wants to abolish and put in a system <laughs> that even conservative backers of the Cato Institute believe will work to keep a white dominant majority in the United States. This is why I say that the words of Steve King Samuel Huntington and President Trump are not radical uh, proposals that are out of the mainstream. They were the mainstream of US immigration policy from the very beginning, only until the last 50 years or so, through the struggle of 
women, black folk, and brown folk in the United States working throughout various kinds of civil rights movements to change our conception of what it should mean to be an American. This is the legacy that President Trump wants to abolish. Okay. I know we're going uh, through a lot of uh, stuff. What I want to say then is this. Uh, I won't go through too much of this uh, to talk about. What my book, Toppling the Melting Pot, tries to do is to look at this kind of history and to ask the question, how have we thought as a country of building a multicultural, multiracial, democratic society? What should be the foundation of that kind of idea? For many, many years throughout the 20th century, the guiding sort of idea or metaphor for immigrants in the United States was this notion of the melting pot. The melting pot came into American conversations around 1908. It was a Broadway play originally by a man by the name of Israel Zvangil, a Jewish immigrant to the United States. And it told the story of these two young lovers, David and Vera, who had come to the United States and fallen in love. It's kind of a Romeo and Juliet story. The idea was that in the old world, they would never have been able to have gotten together because in fact, I think it is the case, Vera's family back in the old country were anti-Semitic military who engaged in pogroms on David's family. So in the old world, there were these racial, religious animosities. But here in the United States, the melting pot story goes, <coughs> they could fall in love, right? And so it's a very 